Welcome to this presentation about open banking, open finance, what it is and what does it mean to Jersey. My name is Mike Kelly. I'm the founder of Stateless Consulting. We're a consultancy that helps financial businesses with the strategy, design and delivery of financial technology. My background, I invented API technology that's used for trillions of transactions all around the world by companies like Amazon, Geico, Temenos. Uh, I worked at Starling Bank on their API strategy, uh, most recently worked at Open Banking, leading the delivery of variable recurring payments. This is a key piece of sort of payments infrastructure in the UK uh, that I'm sure everyone will be hearing a lot about over the coming months and years. So what is open banking about? Open banking is fundamentally about efficiency. It's about using automation to knit together a customer's disparate financial accounts across different financial institutions to provide insights and eliminate otherwise manual processes for them. Open banking allows customers to be able to connect apps and services to their financial accounts so that those apps can interact with their accounts on their behalf. Those interactions would involve the pulling of data, but also other functions on the accounts, such as payments and identity. One example would be connecting a business's accounting system to their bank account so that it can automatically pull in statements and transactional data on a daily or even hourly basis without any manual intervention. Another example would be powering a sweeping service, which connects to a customer's accounts to monitor their accounts and automatically move their funds around, helping them to avoid unnecessary charges and move their funds to where they will gain the most interest. Open banking has been a huge success for the UK. To date, there are over 300 providers in the ecosystem. That's including banks and fintechs. There are over two and a half million UK consumers and businesses now using open banking enabled products on a daily basis. And activity in terms of account interactions overall has increased from 66 million in 2018 to nearly 6 billion in 2020. So it's clear that this has become a significant trend in financial services in a very, very short space of time. So now let's get a bit more into the nitty gritty of what open banking is. Um, in order to understand open banking, one needs to really understand something called PSD2. PSD2 or the Payment Services Directive 2 is a piece of EU regulation which achieves two things. Firstly, it compels financial firms that operate accounts for customers to provide a way for third party providers to be able to plug into customer accounts. So you can think of this much as the way that your uh, laptop has various different ports on the outside of it in order for third party providers to be able to, you know, plug in uh, peripherals that they've built into your uh, into your laptop in very much the same way PSD2 uh, compels uh, providers of financial accounts to allow customers to be able to plug in um, other third-party services. Um, but PSD2 doesn't actually, it, it doesn't it doesn't compel the banks to provide it in a certain way. So there's lots of different ways that the, that the port could be designed. Uh, and in fact, PSD2 has many different sort of shapes of implementation. So the second thing that PSD2 does is it provides a classification uh, for service providers as financial institutions. So these third party providers, uh, up until PSD2 existed, didn't have a regulatory classification. There was no um, sort of, there was no clear category that these institutions fit into. And PSD2 created that framework um, that, that both classifies and provides detail on the regulatory treatment uh, of those firms as financial institutions. So again, back to this metaphor, really what we're talking about here is a, a form of licensing regulated structure uh, that uh, aff affords companies to be able to build um, the peripherals that get plugged into these different adapters. So in parallel to PSD2, the UK undertook, or the CMA rather undertook, um, some investigations into uh, competition in retail banking. Uh, one of the major reports from this is called the Fingleton Report. And this came some some fail, fairly um, conclusive recommendations around uh, what was re sort of referred to as open banking. 
Now, off the back of uh, the Fingerton Report uh, and others, um, the CMA commissioned something called the Open Banking Working Group. This put together uh, a group of sort of financial experts and API experts, um, of which I was a member, in fact. Uh, and this put together a, a effectively a recommendation for the CMA about how to proceed um, in terms of structuring and delivering open banking in the UK. And this had a lot of very strong similarities to PSD2. Um, aside from that, it did one additional thing on top of PSD2, and that was to prescribe a very specific standard for how that port that third party providers would connect to is designed. So rather than leave this up to market actors or uh, several standard bodies, the recommendation was that the UK should have its have should establish one single standard uh, that would apply across all institutions in the UK under open banking. Um, and there are various benefits of that, but the primary one being efficiency. It's much simpler for integrators, um, for third party services to integrate various banks if they all accord with the same standard. So really, when we talk about open banking in the UK, what we're really talking about is the open banking standard that's built on top of the regulatory structure provided by PSD2. And that leads neatly on to open finance. So open banking was primarily focused on personal and SME current accounts. So personal and business current accounts. Now, finance clearly is uh, much broader than just retail banking. Um, and so when people talk about open finance, what they're really talking about is taking the principles from open banking, that is um, empowering the customer um, by allowing them to connect their parties to their accounts to interact with the products and services um, that they have with the service provider, is to take that principle and apply it to you know a, a wider breadth of finance. So that can include you know elements of finance such as private wealth, uh, pensions, mortgages, insurance, um, even down to, to, to new areas that I know that uh, Dave, who I'm going to be chatting with um, very shortly, is, is interested in. Uh, and so open finance really is, is, is quite simple. It's applying the principles of open banking into a broader um, set of financial services. So I'd like to just conclude with what the opportunities are for Jersey around open banking. So I think they all fundamentally rely on Jersey investing in open banking alignment with the UK and the EU. So that's not just open banking, it's also regulatory alignment around PSD2. And I think there's three major benefits that can come from that. The first of which is you know domestic benefits for Jersey consumers and businesses. So that's allowing the development of third party services built around open banking and, and, and open finance more broadly. Uh, it will also open up the Jersey market to UK and European third party services that are being built around uh, open banking propositions. Secondly, I think it would attract fintechs to the island, both as a as a destination for them to structure from, but also ultimately as a sandbox environment where these third party fintechs can develop and test propositions uh, in a in a confined environment, a constrained environment. And finally, I think Jersey proactively engaging in open banking lays the foundation uh, for them to lead further development of open finance over the coming months and years, particularly in areas such as funds and private wealth, where Jersey clearly has um, vested interest in, in, in seeing that, that side of the market develop develop well. So that's it. I think um, it's time for a conversation with Dave. Well, hi, Mike, and thanks very much for that introduction to the whole topic of open banking. I, I really appreciated it. Um, the reason I wanted to talk to you about it was, was well, obviously, because, because you have very hands-on practical experience from the very early days of it, but also because you and I have talked from time to time about where it's going. And I, and I think that might be very relevant to, to some of the people in our audience 
who are looking at what a strategy in Jersey might look like around around this kind of thing. So, so thanks for giving up the time. I really appreciate. Oh, it. you're more than welcome. Now, um, and you used to live on Jersey, didn't you? I did. Yeah, I lived in Jersey for six years. Well, so uh, my my wife is from Jersey, and uh, we lived there. Worked for various companies doing all sorts of IT stuff, uh, software engineering. Built um, a software as a service business back when it was called managed services. So all sorts of stuff like that. So you you know the the point I'm making is you understand the environment and the balance of the industry here and and quite why it's important to get the strategy right on these kind of things. So thanks for that. So if we just sort of summarize roughly where we are at the moment, and tell me if you think this is an unfair summary. We have rudimentary. So it's a, actually let me start with a different slight point. Open banking in different parts of the world means different things. Mm -hmm. we're, we're talking about the UK and Europe, where it's a, a regulatory driven open banking framework. And where that is at the moment is very high level. The what people call the read services, getting data out of people's accounts under their control, of course. Those services have been around um, for a couple of years. They haven't really revolutionized anything in the personal space, have they? I mean, for the average consumer, it doesn't make that much of a difference, to be honest, at the moment. Not for mainstream, I would say not for mainstream consumers. I think there are pockets, there are niches of consumers, highly engaged, financially sort of uh, engaged customers who are picking up services that are aggregating across their accounts. Um, sort of like we used to see with the traditional PFM propositions, but in terms of widespread off proposition uh, for consumers, at least, it, it's not quite so widely adopted yet. Correct. And, and, and it's fair to say that's because a lot of the really important use cases are sort of bubbling under the surface. So people like you and I see them, but, but people don't see them in the consumer space and don't get excited about it sort of because mm -hmm. of that. It's not quite true in the small business space, though, is it? I mean, I think in the SME space, um, the uh, the value added that can be generated by connecting up small business accounts, that's a little different, right? Absolutely. Uh, and I think that you know, that's true both in the on the kind of data side and that, I mean, I, I mentioned the sort of the, the classic open banking example, which is connecting your bank accounts to, you know, your accounting system. Yeah, uh, but... And, and even in the payment side, in, like invoice payables, people are starting to use open banking payments, single immediate payments uh, for those types of um, payable journeys as well. Yeah, so, so I think, um, I mean, we can sort of describe the dynamic at high level as for, for a small business, e.g. me, right? Being able to connect QuickBooks or whatever to your bank so that when you open up your quickbooks or your bank accounts and credit cards i mean that's great you know mm -hmm. um and and there are companies building on top of that in a couple of different ways so you know we see some great companies like modular and people like that who who build that into a service that they that they provide to other companies they, and they've got a lot of investment we see companies, I think TrueLayer just got 70 or 80 million, didn't they? So you see companies that, that provide the API layer, uh, sort of they're doing quite well. And we see companies like uh, Coconut and so on, who take the data from the small business accounts and do something useful with it. Like, you know, help, help. I mean, small businesses are, are you know, typically quite inefficient users of financial services. By, by which I mean they use overdrafts and credit cards and stuff like that. So, so actually getting some of that data together, you can, you can get them a better deal and, and everyone's happy. So again, super high level. On the consumer side, there's a sort of PFM aggregation play, doesn't set the world on fire. On the SME side, actually that's led to some new products and services. But as you alluded to there, um, we're moving from what we might call the read era where you, where you read data from consumer to what people call the read write era, where you can actually send instructions to people's accounts, principally being you know send some money to me yep. or, or somebody else, and we're beginning to see those at retail point of sale as well, 
Um, so why has it taken them a little while to get going? I mean, I know that you, you know, you've done a lot of work in this space mm. um, and it has taken a while for those to get going, hasn't it? Yeah, I think that one of the main challenges has been um, open banking delivered as part of its kind of first sort of, uh, suite of um, propositions included in the standard was a, a, a type of payment which they've called single immediate payment. And that's a payment where the customer sort of is redirected to their bank to authorize the payment each time. And one of the issues, particularly with consumer experiences, is that a lot of consumers expect um, a kind of connect my bank account and leave it type experience, like the kind of payment that gets made when you get out of an Uber. And unfortunately, the way that so the first iteration of open banking payments was designed was that mechanism where the customer has to be involved and manually authorize each individual payment. So what's been happening over the course of the last sort of 18 months is that um, open banking has delivered something called variable recurring payments. And that is um, quite a significant change in terms of sort of the, the customer experience of how payments work. And that is essentially where a third party provider can connect to your account, you can give permission to a third party provider. And then that third party provider without your permission subsequently, can make subsequent varying uh, payments out of your account without having to defer back to you. And yes. one of the reasons that that was sort of that it was struggled, not struggled, but it, but it took some time um, to get to grips with was because there's a lot more risk associated with third party providers, um, sort of handling that level of consent taking on that kind of responsibility with consumers, there were concerns around um, the regulatory treatment. So for example, PSD two has a whole bunch of rules inside of it called uh, the RTS regulatory technical standards. And there was some dispute about the, the sort of treatment of this VRP thing under that structure. So there was there's a whole bunch of things that really need to get kind of ironed out from a regulatory point of view. And that's something that I've sort of spent the last 12 months working on and as of March was sort of finally ratified and is now officially part of the kind of open banking standard. So so just to unpack that a little bit, Mike, because I, I, I want people to see the big, big picture. Mm -hmm. With PSD2 in place, um, I can have an app or something on my phone, which can go to my bank account and say, you know, send some money to somewhere, right? So, and that's great, you know, but it's a hassle because for security reasons, obviously, you know, you need me to authenticate that transaction with, as we'd want, you know. So. But as you say, that sort of limits the utility slightly. Mm -hmm. Remember in the in the old cards world, we used to say there were the, the two. There was cards present and card not present, and they were the right. sort of two cases. So what we're getting in the in the open banking world is we're sort of getting um, the customer present, and the customer was present. So in other words, you know, you have the kind of the request to pay platform, which says, you know, I'm the plumber. Ask Dave to to pay this bill, mm -hmm. and then you've got the the variable recurring payments platform which says i'm amazon dave's just bought something again uh please can you send me the money yeah i think if, if we have any people from the cards world listening in they might get a little bit uh confused with that comparison only because card not present doesn't necessarily mean weirdly that the customer is not present so a card not present transaction is actually an online transaction. So, uh, yeah, no, that's really that's that's a really bad so the, example. The distinction is really about the customer either attending the to the payment or is an unattended payment on behalf of the customer. It's really to do with the presence of the customer. Although when you talk about card not present in the card world, it, it kind of means something well, slightly. Like, forget I ever mentioned cards. <laughs> Let's forget I ever mentioned cards. Yeah. We, uh, we we've got the basic platform. So so we've got. We've got a means of sending money around, faster payments or, or whatever, mm -hmm. and we can access that through our bank. And so we can tell the bank to send somebody some money. That hasn't been a particularly useful service. I mean, I, I personally have used it, you know, a few times, but it's. Um, so, but it needs kind of a layer on top to give it utility for the customer. And in fact, what we're getting is two layers on top. So we're getting we're getting request to pay and we're getting variable recurring payments and and just to very superficially illustrate the difference the plumber will on his phone say i fixed dave's tap send him a bill for 40 pounds and that will pop up on my phone because i i've told the system 
if you get bills send them to you know whatever my barclays app or something mm. and up what my barclays app will pop up and there's the bill from the plumber and it says do you want to pay him and you hit okay and then it tells the bank to send the money to the plumber done mm. the alternative is variable recurring payments where i've told amazon you are allowed to access my bank account actually for a great many people the principal use case is one i think is most interesting is the inland revenue has just awarded a contract to actually a company called ecospend run by a good friend of ours julian wilson mm -hmm. um the inland revenue has just awarded a contract to do this for tax and i can't i've just done it again this month where you log in to do your paye and everything in it and you click a button to say pay and then you have some incredibly complicated image to fill out these cut and you never do it so mm -hmm. then you go to use your card and type in exactly the same card details that i've typed in for the past four years into exactly the same fields mm -hmm. so instead under vrp i will say the inland revenue is allowed to access my bank account you know in certain circumstances and so what will actually happen next time is you owe your PAYE. Do you want to pay it? OK. Mm -hmm. Right. And your feeling is, I know, that um, this opens up a whole lot of use cases which will make open banking much more integral to people's financial experience. Is that a fair way? Of yeah, it? definitely. And I think that's true of the business um, banking world but it's particularly true of the consumer banking world because a lot of the consumer open banking propositions at the moment tend to provide consumers with with, with kind of insights so it tells them how they might want to move their money from this account to that account but for consumers that's quite a lot of friction whereas what vrp opens up is the ability for those service providers not just to provide a recommendation but to actually proactively move funds around on behalf of the customer and really get to optimize um you know their financial health and i think the ability to be able to move around their their funds is is a really significant shift well fi financial health we're going to cut back around to in a minute so so just just put a pin in that for a moment because we're coming mm -hmm. on back to that but just to just to finish the point about these new platforms going into place for, you know, why would Jersey Telecom want to use VRP instead of using boring old direct debit or standing orders? Uh, the main reason is cost. So we have this kind of ubiquitous uh, faster payments infrastructure in the UK and um, in Jersey indirectly as well. Uh, this is, you know, ostensibly, you know, free and instant bank transfers. Now, they're not actually free. There's a cost underneath them. But at least for most UK consumers, they're not charged to make a a faster payment. So the costs associated with taking payment from consumers over these instant bank transfer rails is significantly lower uh, than over the card networks. And there, there, I mean, there are other big benefits. The other cost, a big cost in payments, marginal cost is fraud and, 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 and managing risk. And again, the mechanisms of open banking are extremely secure. So for a start, when you grant the consent, you're granting the consent through a strong customer authentication in the bank's app. There's a whole load of fancy cryptography that goes on there under the hood that protects you as a consumer to make sure that no consent can be created without you giving explicit permission. And then the consents themselves have what are called consent parameters in them. So for example, you might give your, uh, you might give the, the company that takes your water bill you might give them a maximum limit per month of 150 pounds. Whereas Amazon, the maximum limit might be a thousand pounds because that's how much you do with them per month. For example, you could change the maximum amount per individual payment. So for the water bill, it might be 150 pound per payment, but with Amazon, it might be 50 pounds per payment. So you can, you can add these parameters onto these consensus extremely secure, not only for the consumer, but it's actually, it's actually good for the merchant as well because it allows them to kind of constrain the, the liability that they take on and uh, but it's not all about payments is it because i mean some of the kind of more interesting applications uh, certainly that i i've been involved with here um the reasons why companies want access to the bank account isn't always because they want to rummage through your transactions to to try and save you some money on a credit card or 
or you know or anything else to do with payments mm -hmm. it could be for example they want to know that you exist as a as an actual person or right. that you have a job or or you know whatever and, and people have been building some great companies using open banking to to look at your bank account to assess your ability to pay short-term loans or whatever so it's not just about payments it's about getting access to the account to deliver you know useful services to people and obviously um there are a lot of applications for that but you mentioned financial health so i want to just i want to just circle back around to that by going back to something you said at the beginning so right now open banking applies to what accounts so personal current accounts and business current accounts right so there, are, there are some heuristics for defining you know a business current account versus a corporate account i can't off the top of my head remember what the heuristic is but there's a, there's a distinction made essentially it's consumer current accounts and sme current accounts now in the in the actually very good uh review of the consumer use of open banking one of the one of the key points of that review was that for open banking to really benefit consumers and, and provide businesses with with you know new opportunities for products and services it had to move from being what you might call simple open banking just those accounts to open finance Mm. What, what did they mean by open finance? So open finance, if you sort of simplify it down, is applying the same principles from open banking. So this is empowering the customer to be able to connect regulated third parties to be able to interact with their accounts. That's what open banking is really about, but it's constrained to current accounts. What open finance is about is applying the exact same principle, but across the breadth of financial products and services. So this could be, you know, it could be a wealth management account. It could be, there's, there's many different kinds of sort of financial accounts that people have, savings accounts, yada, yada, yada. And, and what open finance is about is about opening up that same, that same kind of access to third parties so that they can really pull in and start to knit together the, the complete kind of the, the, the full picture of someone's financial life. And, and what kinds of what kinds of applications are what, why were they so keen on seeing this move to open finance uh well i, th I think really for the for the main point that you made or, or you alluded to which was this this question around financial health both for c consumers and businesses i think and i think really if you're going to create kind of uh cohesive solutions which really help people get to grips with their financial health you need to have full access to the you know array of um a kind of elements that are involved in that process and 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 the current account is one important element of people's financial lives but it's by no means the um you know the full extent of it and so i think that the principle of open finance is that whilst there's been success in open banking no doubt and 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 there's a lot of promise there that actually there's a there's a missed opportunity if the same principle isn't applied more broadly across the whole of, of, of people's kind of, um, you know, financial lives. I mean, I personally think it's quite interesting to see how that's evolved. You know, this idea of having a sector that instead of providing individual financial services, provides overall financial health and improvement in overall financial health. I mean, a great, a great many consumers, um, really don't understand how i mean i don't you know i don't understand pensions and things like that i'd much rather have a super intelligent artificial intelligence which we were discussing on the island a couple of years ago actually about this kind of thing but but i'd much rather have a super intelligent you know giant ai bot thing sorting out my pension than me doing i don't know what i'm doing so i think the the key with open banking is that the, it's it's a creating this type of institution which is as you as you mentioned is is not operating the account they are an independent third party so i think they have they're able to build a business that has very strongly aligned incentives with the customer 
And I think what's going to be interesting is to see the kind of how the business model for these types of businesses emerges, because I think those types of businesses are going to have to look towards business models where, you know, their, their incentives are aligned with the customer. So if the customer is winning, if the customer is, you know, saving, then those propositions are winning. If they become a kind of glorified, um, what's the word, sort of um, just, just referring customers to different financial products that could sort of, I think not not quite have the desired outcome, uh, the, the kinds of propositions that you're but alluding to. That, that's not what I'm envisaging on the wealth management side, because I, I'm sort of imagining what's going to happen it, fairly soon, I would hope. What's going to happen is I, I'm running, you know, I, let's, let's say Nutmeg as an example. So I'm running something like Nutmeg, and I've set my risk parameters, and I've set my goals and things like that. And then, but then now I still have to go and set up the bank transfers and mess around moving money around from one place to another, which isn't very value adding use of my time. Um, what I'd like to do is to be able to interact with an intelligent real AI wealth management service, which I'm sure these guys will deliver. But then when I say, okay, get on with it, get on with it. You know, they should be able to use APIs to open the accounts they need to open, to move money from one account to another account. Mm. Even those simple examples you were talking about, which is sweeping money into deposit accounts when it's not being used in other places. Moving money between different kinds of investments, who knows, even cryptocurrency and things like that. That's a pretty realistic goal. Absolutely. That, that's, a, that's a financial sector which is delivering health at as far as I can tell, a much lower cost, which is what it comes down to, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And it's an area that Jersey really specializes in, right? I mean, this is, this is, this is, the, this is the type of um, you know, customer service that Jersey is renowned for in the finance world. Yeah, no, that's why I was thinking, you know, I, I would, you know, if I was dealing with these a super intelligent AI bot, um that was regulated in jersey then i would have some trust in that you know mm -hmm. compared to things but um and actually not just for high net wealth of course because that, that kind of automation would mean that you could deliver financial health you know to, to to people with much less in terms of assets because you could afford it to deliver those services which you couldn't otherwise do so uh and, and obviously in examples like that i'm assuming that uh, in time, there'll be an evolution of consumer protections and data rights and so on that goes with that. I mean, I'm not, mm -hmm. I'm taking that for granted that that goes with it. But actually, what opportunities does that open up for the banks themselves? Because, you know, I'm thinking about it while I'm talking about it with you. And I can, there's probably people out there from banks thinking, well, wait a second, this just turns us into very heavily regulated, low margin utility pipes, basically. I mean, if, if the government is going to force us to open up our accounts and give that data away to, I mean, let's, let's you know, name some names here, Amazon, Google, Facebook, and so on. Mm -hmm. That's not very good for us. And they've got a point, haven't they? Oh, they have a point, I think. I mean, especially if you look at the nature of open banking as an initiative, I mean, it's a competition remedy. So the intent of open banking was to, to produce this outcome to put more competitive pressure on the nine largest retail banks in the UK. So that was the state, the sort of explicit stated purpose of open banking. So I think you absolutely hit the nail on the head. And I think most people inside of the CMA listening to that would would sort of agree and, and would and would consider their job well done that was what they were intending to achieve now i think the sort of slightly more nuanced view may be that slightly less um alarming for people inside of retail banks is that ultimately banking is still highly regulated activity so this isn't something that institutions can just willy-nilly jump in and out of the incumbent banks that already have large balance sheet had large economies of scale, which allow them to offer extremely competitive products um, that, that, that consumers, you know, will, will prefer, prefer over less scalable, um, uh, less scalable products. So I think there is, there is definitely a challenge coming for, um, particularly for retail banks, I think the open finance thing is probably a, a good 
I would say three or four years away, realistically. I think it's going to happen fairly rapidly when it does happen, but I think realistically, maybe two, three, four years. But I think for retail banks, I think they're going to have to become more efficient. Um, but again, I mean, if financial, you know, fintech companies are taking care of the customer relationship, there's the potential for the banks to become considerably more efficient. So a lot of the cost base of these banks is around the relationship that they have with the customer. If they're able to remove um, that sort of large part of their co cost base, you know, the economics of their of their business could improve rather than get worse. The unit economics could improve, By and focusing the on business the could become the considerably more scalable. So, yeah. I think there's there's a there's a sort of uh, how do I say it? There's there's definitely a lot of pressure, but there's also a, a considerable amount of opportunity for the for the institutions that that get it right and, and make the right moves early. Let's um, let's finish up by circling back around to one of the other points you made in the presentation, and it, it it's the one that interests me the most, really, which is that um, I don't care about making things more efficient for banks and, and whatever's up to them, but um, but you make the point about innovation, about opening up the APIs creating a, a, an environment, a platform for innovation, an environment where people would develop new products and services. And I know, you know, you're, you're a, you know, I, I'm just an advisor, but you're a more entrepreneurial person than I am. You've, you've started some actual businesses in this space. Just, just be honest with people here. I mean, what, what have your experiences been um, playing around with open banking in the UK? Uh, and if I can sort of push it a little bit, if Jersey was going to go in that direction, how how could they do it a little bit better? What could, what could we learn from from what the UK has already done in that space? So I mean I, I'm I'm sort of biased because I have a you know very strong um, uh, instinct that this variable recurring payment stuff is important. But my advice would be to kind of skip the step that open bank i mean it's taken open banking you know four years to get to vrp and i think now that the work has been done in the uk uh, I, I authored through open banking authored a consultation paper on variable recurring payments which went into a lot of detail around the consumer protection issues and the regulatory treatment under psd2 and all this stuff that needed to be figured out um, to take that um, kind of investment that's been made in the uk and 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 that kind of structuring that's been done and then sort of skip forward. So not to kind of leave the payment stuff out as a second phase is to deliver it as a as a whole package, both with the data and the payments, because I think that can kind of you can hit the ground running that way. Um, you can, you can you can really make a big impact very quickly. But I would I would strongly I mean, the UK really has led Europe, I would say on PSD2. And part of the reason for that is because they, you know, they, they failed fast. So they they delivered stuff. It wasn't quite enough. It needed to be tweaked. Stuff needed to be added, and that was, you know, very, very beneficial for I think the entire of Europe, to be honest, because the UK has really led, uh, led the way. And I think there's a lot to be learned that Jersey can take and sort of at the end of the UK's journey, tag along and and really quite quite tightly harmonise with what the UK's already achieved on the current account um, space and, and and the retail banking space. Now the UK is engaging in the same process in open finance. And I think that's somewhere where Jersey really, I think, ought to be a little bit more proactive. So I think this is now, now, now that sort of things are starting to kind of get into Jersey's wheelhouse on the, you know, private wealth and, and, and the fund side, I think that Jersey should, should definitely have its hat in the ring and the institutions in Jersey should, should have more direct involvement in terms of the the, the trajectory of how that standardization process works and, and how those types of propositions might emerge over the coming years, because there's no guarantee that it will be regulatory driven. And you made a good observation at the start, which is that there's a difference between regulatory driven and market driven open banking. And certainly Jersey may not even need to take a kind of regulatory approach. It may be that, you know, institutions in Jersey can be forward thinking and actually engage in a lot of this open finance stuff without the regulator having to kind of jump in and compel them to do it yeah that's also true so but i just i'm in in terms of actually encouraging you know entrepreneurs such as yourself to to to, to build new businesses on top of the platforms um what could we do a little better there maybe 
So I think the the one thing the UK has going for it at the moment is the FCA have the FCA sandbox. This is a an envi- a regulatory environment where certain aspects of regulation that are either unclear or don't exist yet, where the rules can be kind of temporarily suspended in a kind of test environment where the fintechs can kind of interact with the regulator so that the regulator can kind of um, get a better understanding of the proposed activity and the regulated or the uh, the fintechs can kind of get an idea of what would be expected for them um, if if what they were proposing was a regulated activity. And that is really, really important when it comes to kind of bleeding edge stuff like open finance is to have that very direct relationship with the fintechs and also for the for the banks to have those relationships as well because ultimately if the banks are going to be exposing apis for products there may be risk implications there may be all sorts of stuff you know there may be systemic implications that the regulator needs to needs to take a view on so i think that kind of that sandbox environment that the, that the uk has active i think is, is 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 something that jersey again could could emulate very well and would would help a lot yeah, I guess what I was just thinking was if you know if Jersey did decide to go down some sort of open banking route, as you've said, there would be no point in starting from where the UK started from. Uh, you know, we we should start from where we are now. And I think one of the lessons that that I've picked up from from dealing with quite a few entrepreneurs in this space is you know it's that collection of things, isn't it? Because you need the sandbox, you need that you need people, you need you know, sort of the, the bit of energy that gets all this thing going, but without that access to the to the bank accounts, there there are none of these new ideas. There are no new possibilities. So, I think what, one one of the points I'd make there that's interesting, obviously, that's evolved over the last eighteen months or so as we've been going through the COVID crisis, is that increasingly people are very uh, geographically dispersed in terms of their working arrangements. So anything that Jersey can do to um, encourage entrepreneurs to move to Jersey, but to allow those businesses to easily employ people, you know, not only in Europe, but in, in other, in, in other um, continents as well. I think that would be a massive plus because then for entrepreneurs, they get all the benefits from structuring their organization outside or inside of Jersey, but then they still have access to the workforce that, you know, I mean, I'm based in Winchester right now. I don't live in London. But all the people that I work with, people that employ in the startup, these these are people who are living in London. So, I mean, I, I'm not going into London at the moment because of because of lockdown, but I'm still working with them. If I was based in Jersey, it would be exactly the same. So I think that would be exactly Jersey's right. able to we've got kind of make better, it. We've got much better broadband than Winchester does. So. <laughs> well, Jersey's got even better broadband than you, I bet. So, <laughs> But point well taken, Mike. And and again, thanks for thanks for taking the time to give us the view uh, from the leading edge, because it, it is really valuable to me that you've got so much actual practical experience in building on top of open banking. Um, it's, it's really important input to our our thinking, our overall fintech strategy looking forward. So anyway, th- thanks again for giving up your time to talk to me today and uh, just look forward to seeing you again soon when, when all of this is over. Cheers. Yeah. Take care. Thanks, Dave.